Hello and welcome to Mars Hill, the show that examines new ideas and the effects they have on our lives, as well as old ideas and the effects they are still having on our lives. You know, when most of us think of archaeology these days, we generally think of this guy right here, <laughs> Mr. Indiana Jones from all the movies here. I'm holding a novelization of Indiana Jones and the Genesis Deluge, which in a way was a subject of a previous program with my guest here, Dr. Gerald LaRue, in which we talked about um, various investigations or pseudo-investigations mm -hmm. into uh, the mountains of Ararat to see whether or not uh, Noah's Ark existed. And I want to start out by asking, as, a, um, as an archaeologist, um, is this, I mean, we, we, we hear about the city of Troy, about a, a man who was just so obsessed with it that he went out after studying the literature and found Troy, and now we have uh, other would-be archaeologists here, would-be Indiana Jones, studying the mountains of Ararat and reading the Genesis um, accounts and trying to go into Ararat to try to find Noah's Ark. Is this the reality of archaeology? Are they driven, passionate men about uh, finding objects and cities and that sort of thing? That's not the way archaeology works. <laughs> Indiana Jones is probably one of the worst things that could happen in terms of real archaeology. Um, archaeology is involved with a real scientific effort to determine what the culture, cultural remains have to tell us about the people who lived back in certain time and certain space. And uh, what we have discovered is that uh, what you might have thought we'd have known right from the beginning was that as a city is destroyed and another city is built on it and that one is destroyed, we get kind of a layer cake effect. And as we go down, we find layer by layer older and older and older material. The only place where that is not so is where the Romans come in and when they wanted to dig a foundation for a wall, they dug a great big pit through the stuff that's down <laughs> below up on top and built the wall there. But you can always tell where the uh, change takes place by the soil and the examination of material and so on. So what we do is we work in what are called usually five meter squares. That is to say, we measure off a, a square, put pegs in, ropes around the edge, and so on. We begin to investigate along one side of the square, say one meter depth, going down with picks and shovels, till we see a change in the texture of the soil or some new things begin to emerge. And we then take off that whole section. We go down again, layer by layer by layer. And when you hit a wall, then you open another section and another section, and you can trace the wall. It may be a building. It may be part of a defense system. It can be almost anything. But it's very, very carefully done. And we have all sorts of other people with us, experts in pottery, experts in, in botany, paleontology, and so on. This is not something that is done by people going out looking for a treasure like Indiana Jones. Well, you know, I was starting to wonder, because the way you're talking about this, it seems like it would be kind of hit and miss, for instance, how would they know, for instance, underneath a certain plot of ground that they might find the remains of a city or whatever? I mean, it, it sounds almost like you're kind of drilling for oil, in a sense. Not quite. The, the uh, very interesting thing happens, particularly in the Near East, where I did some, some work many years ago. The, when you build a city on top of a city, they always put walls around it. And so you get a hill that, instead of being rounded naturally, it's rounded and then it has kind of a, an abrupt up place on the top. And this is what they call tells. And as we look at the hillside, you go and you examine the hillside, you'll find fragments of pottery indicating somebody lived there. So that this is the beginning. And biblically, if you work with the Bible, uh, many of the places are located. They're mentioned in the Bible, and you can say this is probably such and such a place. Why? Because the Arab name of it may reflect a, a modernization or a change in, in emphasis on the biblical name. And so we use the Bible as kind of a, um, a city map, if you will, to help locate the name of a city. Once in a while, you find the name of the city. For instance, at Gezer, they found outposts with stones on it saying, Gezer, not like you're entering the city of Gezer and Kiwanis meets on such and such a date, or anything like that, but it was an out, out, outside markings indicating the parameter of the city. So it isn't quite as hit and miss as it may seem. Always there are clues, and right now there are hundreds and hundreds of mounds that are marked for excavation in the Middle East. Most of um, what we read about archaeology um, in America today 
tends to be of the type that wants to examine, say, the claims of the Bible. We, we read a lot about uh, excavations going on in the Holy Land and whatnot. In fact, as we mentioned on a previous program, and I'm not going to belabor this point, CBS recently did a couple of controversial series about uh, biblical archaeology that's been criticized by other archaeologists about this. Mm -hmm. what, what is archaeology finding about the Bible? What archaeology generally does is create the background, the mm -hmm. set the stage on which whatever biblical drama exists took place. For instance, um, nobody is able right now to excavate where we believe the site of the ancient temple was. This is because there's a very sacred piece of, of Muslim architecture on that very site. Also, this is because when, once a site is holy, you tend to build over the top of it. So, what did Solomon's temple actually look like? Well, we have a biblical description. And interestingly enough, when we excavate Canaanite temples, they conform to this pattern with an inner room at the back, a next room, and so on, and the two pillars sitting out in front that don't support anything. We still don't know what they're there for, but they all have this kind of pattern. So that what the archaeologist does is examine the Canaanite site at Hatzor or some other place and say, this is the way cities were built, this is the way a temple was built, this is the way an altar was built, and we get an idea of the background against which the Bible can be read and understood. Hmm. Why don't you, um, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the digs that you've been on here where it is permissible for you to go in and dig where you've gotten permission to do so? Oh, well, the permission is no problem if you're with an, a legitimate organization uh -huh. like a university and you have some sort of a reputation. For instance, these fragments here are, are from Petra. Uh, this is in Jordan where Dr. Philip Hammond at the University of Utah is, is, is excavating. Now, as you listen, these are almost like fine china and the thickness of these plates, and you can see this is the rim of a plate, uh, and this is another one, and the decorations on them are absolutely unique. All of these pieces of pottery here, these broken fragments, came from what was called the Katuti dump. This is where the people of the city dumped all their broken stuff. And we know that this comes from the Roman period. All of this material comes from the Roman period. Even this lamp. This is the top of a lamp. Here's the base of a lamp. These are fragments that were thrown away because they were broken. When we find whole vessels like this, they generally come from tombs. And the tombs were caves cut into the, into the limestone, and they would put places in. And if there wasn't a collapse of the roof or something like that, the material was preserved. So out of this, we get to know styles of pottery that at a certain time, well, plastic pottery didn't come in until an age here. So that if we're excavating in the year 4000 back here and we find the plastic, we can say this is the age that this came in and this and this and this. So the same thing is true there. And in some places, they're able to date within 25 years the changes in pottery styles and so on. So this is the kind of background. This is what people used in their home. Let me, let me show you this. This comes from a site, a tomb, that was near the place where Amos wrote. Or no, where Micah wrote, I'm sorry. In fact, I argue with my students, I say, this is the lamp that Micah used when he, yeah. they don't <laughs> believe me. This is olive oil, real olive oil, uh, from today. And that piece of wick in there is just a piece of cotton, cotton batten. And so I'm going to soak this, and with a little bit of luck, uh, I'll let you put the lid back on that. Okay. Uh, we'll take a modern match. This is not the way it would have been done back in those days. These are the sort of things you pick up when you go to a hotel or to a restaurant. You don't know what you're going to do with them, but you're going to use them on television. And we say, along with others, burn, baby, burn. <laughs> um, now, interestingly enough, these are the lamps that were used in the households back in the 8th century, before the Common Era. This one comes from the 2nd or 3rd century of the Common Era. The lamp has changed, completely changed in style. The earlier lamps beyond this were simply bowls. Then somebody squeezed in the side, somebody squeezed in four sides, and then they squeezed in one. Then somebody made a cover for it with a place for the oil to go in. This is a Roman lamp. You can see it's part of the same kind of pattern. There's the spout. There's where the oil went in, and so on. Changes. Now, a number of years ago, a religion program had on a, 
uh, uh, title, had a title that was called Thy Word is my, a Lamp to My Feet. And they showed this great big spotlight showing a path. This is what the writer was talking about. This is the kind of thing. It's like a candle. And what I usually do, which we won't do here, is completely dark in the room. And it's mm -hmm. amazing how much light comes from this. But this is what was in the home of the average Hebrew well, family. How old would you estimate this, uh, this lamp being here? How old? Yeah, how about, about how old would you estimate this thing? This thing is about 2,800, 2,700 years old. 2,700. And when you do use it like for a practical demonstration like this, uh, uh, are we doing any damage to this? We're not doing it any good, but we, these things are, <laughs> it's like finding uh, uh, something from, uh, 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 that's common in every household, uh -huh. like cups or glasses and so on. The, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of these have been found. So this is not that. So this unique. is a pretty common, common thing to find. This is, the yeah, area. and they would have several in their home, and when they buried the dead, they put the light in there with them too. What have we learned about the uh, people of Petra? Well, this is still uh, going on with, with Hammond's uh, um, uh, excavations. These were merchants who uh, governed the trade routes, and this was a, a central city. They had trade routes all through southern Israel, down into the uh, Saudi Arabia, and so on. And wherever you go, you find this kind of pottery as characteristic that belongs to them. It's very easy to identify the sites. There's more to it than that. This, by the way, is part of a sieve. See, uh, another thing we do pay attention to, and I'm going to de deviate for a minute, and these are the bases. See how the different bases, the different styles. Mm -hmm. We collect handles. And, and rims and so on. All of these are clues to archaeologists. And all of these came, all of these came from the one site. And you have the Roman, particular uh, Roman, Roman type, and then, of course, the particular uh, Nabataean uh, style of pottery. And so this is, these are people whose, whose uh, business relationships extended throughout the Near Eastern world. They were the merchants uh, of the time. Now this, would have oil coming from a jar like this. This is what they call a black oil juglet. And it's unique in that you can see here on the side where the potter took a, a little stick and uh, burnished it, polished it. And this would hold the oil. It doesn't sit up, so it would have to sit in something that would have a ring, or it could sit on a dirt floor, or it could hang on a wall on a peg. This is a head of a goddess from the same period. Uh, these, this is the mother goddess. And uh, this particular head, with its hairstyle, when it was found, this was in the time of Eisenhower, this was called the Mary, Mamie, Mamie Eisenhower hairdo, because that's the way she, her hair was done. Uh, the body, this came with a, a pointed tenon point here, mortise and tenon joint. You would buy the head, and you would model the body, and it was usually a, a very full-breasted woman holding her breasts like this, and it, with a flared skirt. She was the mother goddess the goddess who gave nutrition. And uh, so again, when you read in Jeremiah and you read in these others about the mother goddess, this is who they're talking about. And she would be like having a crucifix in your home. You have these figurines. Huh. This is a sling stone. And I tell my students, this is the very one that killed Goliath. And of course, I show them the exact place where it hit. But nobody believes me. Gosh, See, I wonder why. <laughs> I raise a group of skeptics. We find these inside city walls, particularly at the defense points, inside the gate and so on, where you would have to go up in the tower to defend the gate area. And these are piled up. They're shaped out of limestone, and they're pretty solid. You get that coming through the air at you. And remember, the cities are built up on a hillside, so that you have the advantage of the, the pellet coming down over the side of the hill. So there could be some validity to a portion of the story of David and Goliath. Oh, yes, sure. I mean, the, 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 the use of slings, we've got this in all sorts of inscriptions. This is from the Greco-Roman period. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Malady's makeup kit. She would grind the, the makeup in this, and then she would apply the dark to her eyes or the shade of malachite to her, the, the shading under her eyes. And this is alabaster, and if we held it up to the light, you could see through it. And she would keep some of the material in there and use a little stick that we, our little bronze uh, uh, thing that we have that, uh, see, uh, you're right. you can see it's translucent. This is glass that came from uh, an excavation that I was involved in at Hebron. And uh, this is from a later period. This is an Arab bracelet from a glass bracelet for... 
I suppose you give it to your lady friend for a very fragile relationship, I'm not sure. <laughs> and all of these colors, this is the piece of uh, molten glass that uh, was a discard. All these colors in here are the oxidization, look at this, uh, the oxidization of the metallic impurities in the silicas that were used to form the uh, whatever vessel they're, they're from. And uh, the greens are from the, uh, the uh, copper, and the oranges are from the uh, irons, and so on. Now this piece is very special. This is a mummified hand. Ah. And so when we read about mummification, uh, I have a show and tell piece for my classes. Uh, you can see here the, the uh, wrapping, the linen wrapping. In fact, it shows up very clearly there, the, the actual pores in the, in the linen. And this is a woman's hand. Uh, the thumb is missing. And when you turn it over, you can see when it was wrenched off the body that the bones of the hand are exposed. And these are the ten tendons that motivate the fingers. And the coating on this is probably tar from the Dead Sea. This hand is a couple of thousand years old. I have students who say, yuck, when they look <laughs> at it. And I just say, after 2,000 years, you should look so good. And then I tell them, whenever I'm lonely, uh, there's never a refusal, <laughs> and so on. So we have some fun with it. But these are the kinds of things that come from the excavations. And what they do, they tell us, when we talk about the, the Hebrews going down into Egypt and the mummification of the body, that's a mummified hand. That's what it would look like. That's the way they did things. And we know now from the examination of mummies in Egypt and the, and the, ex, and the, the unwrapping of them and the, the uh, x-raying of them, that they made a cut in the groin. They'd reach up, take out the intestines, wash them, in wine and deposit them in, in sacred jars under the various gods. Then they would fill the body with balls of linen soaked in resin, or sometimes if you've got a cheap burial with mud balls, and uh, then they'd wrap the body after a whole ceremony. And all of this is done ceremonially. It isn't done as it is in our mortuaries. Every With the wrapping would come the incantations of the priests and so on as they prepared the body for the afterworld and immortality. Well, it doesn't sound, you know, when I've heard about in, in the embalming or the mummification process of the Egyptians, it's always shrouded in mystery like this is something we just don't know that much about. But the way you're describing it, it sounds like we know what the process of mummification was. We know an awful lot about it. it was, the body was soaked in, a, in natron, which is a dehydrating uh, salt, and it just takes all the moisture out of the body and you'd have the dehydrated body that would then be wrapped. The reason they took the intestines out, of course, and washed them and washed the, in the cavity of the body was to prevent decay and, and, and uh, the molding of the body. And uh, the uh, heart was left in because in Egyptian thought, like in biblical thought, the heart was the organ of, as a man thinks in his heart, well, we know people don't think in their heart, mm -hmm. uh, but that was the organ of, of intelligence. Sometimes the, no, the brain was removed by reaching up through the nostrils into the hook and pulling that out, but in some instances the brain was still there. Uh, sounds very gruesome, but all of it has a religious connotation. Everything has to do with a faith system. And along with the burial of the body were the steps that were necessary to enter into the fields of immortality. At first, mummification, well, we think it began because when they buried people in the desert sands, all they did was dehydrate. And if you go up to the museum in, in Salt Lake City, on the Temple Museum on the second floor, they have Hopi Indians who died in caves and they're simply desiccated. And in Peru, they, they uh, also uh, desiccated the body for, or mummified the body, and so on. This is not something that's absolutely unique, but the Egyptian pattern is unique, the way in which it was done, and the rituals associated with it. And we have an awful lot of information about this now. What do we find out about uh, these ancient people when we, studying them, when we study them? Basically, what I'm getting at is we have talked about how the stories in the Bible are very violent how these uh, tend to be a very violent people. In your study of primitive cultures, uh, do you find that, for the most part, that's just the way society was? Was it in general a violent society, or were there some societies that had, say, different religions that maybe were not as violent as other societies? There's violence in every society. 
The difficulty is the biblical story is the story of conquest, the acts of the God on behalf of his people, and they're generally the, the acts of violence. What we're not told is the ordinary everyday life of people that's represented by this material. People, uh, children were born, you could hear the crying in the nearby houses because they're built one to the, uh, next to the other. Animals were taken into, into the courtyards and into, even into the houses for protection. Uh, very simple patterns that went on everyday life. All we got is temple literature in the Bible. The Bible is temple literature. This is not the correspondence of, of some young man who's out on the front lines writing back to his girlfriend or anything of this nature. All of that's gone. So we have, but we do have some very good historians writing in this who would talk about the kings, give us a sequence of the kings, talk about who their enemies were, and when we excavate in Babylon, we find things that document. For instance, in the, there's a story of King Jehu, who has to pay homage to the Assyrians. What has been found in the excavation of Kala by Layard was a stele that pictures the Hebrew king, or the Israelite king, on his hands and knees, bowing down in front of the uh, overlords of, uh, of, uh, of the Assyrians. Confirmation, yes, cross-references. In biblical, it is because the God, Hebrew God, demands this, or subjects it in, in the Assyrians, is because our God, Ashur, is stronger and he beat these people. Hmm. That must certainly make it difficult, though, for you as an archaeologist to try to understand what life was like for the average person back during these times, when you consider that the literature that we get is always grandiose. It's talking about kings and emperors and gods, and they must have considered ordinary life so trivial as not to even write about it. Well, you get hints of it. You get the exploitation of widows and orphans and the prophetic protest against this kind of thing. Uh, we get the story of Ruth, which is a, a, a dramatized story of very simple gleaning in the fields and people uh, seeking to survive. And when you get down in there, I, I'll tell you, it's a very moving thing to pull away a stone and go in there and see people laid out in burial the way they were left by the people who loved them and put them there. And uh, in a sense, we violate the sanctity of, of the past and the, of the tomb. What I generally did when we found bodies was we would take the bones and we'd wrap them in heavy plastic and rebury them in a place where we thought they would never be disturbed again. But we go in and we examine the tomb, the structure of the tomb, the way it's built and so on, and we take away these artifacts. I could have brought along some anklets that we took off the bones of a young woman lying in the tomb. Uh, who gave them to her, maybe her father, her lover, her mother, uh, whatever. They had meaning for her. And all of these things had meaning. Some young woman utilized this and utilized this. Some family had this in their home. Uh, these were plates that were used in the Nabataean culture. This was a goddess who was looked at. This was a tool of war. We have spears and arrowheads and all that sort of stuff too. And all of these bits of glass represent the creative artistry of a people of the past, broken, it's true, but this is a very clever piece of work, this bracelet, with the, with the light-colored glass wound around the dark-colored glass. Mm. And uh, while it's fragile, it, it's still rather beautiful. So we're moving in and we're finding these people were just like we are. They didn't have television, they didn't have the world communication. News traveled very, very slowly. It had to be brought by courier, but Nevertheless, they lived in a world that was as real to them as our world is. The scholar by the name of Gaster has coined a word called topocosm, and it means the place world, and it's all that's involved in the environment that is part of yours. Our place world has now expanded. Something happens across in Europe, and we're informed of it immediately. We see it on television as it's happening. Completely new world. Our world has shrunk, and we have become in the words that some people don't like, one world. We are one fellowship of people. Uh, and this has been the humanist argument for a long, long time, that we are one people. Now, if uh, some of our DNA studies are accurate, we may all have come from one mother in Africa, uh, which scholars with that sense of humor they have call Eva, uh, the, the primitive Eve. And the migration of people up out of Africa into all parts of the world including North America, mean we are one people. We're coming down to our last three minutes. Sure. And um, I'd like to ask you, maybe in wrapping up, 
Um, what what your thoughts are if you have any kind of commentary about anything regarding say the way archaeology may be misused by people who might want to take just bits and pieces of uh, found knowledge without really looking at the whole and using it to back up whatever agenda whether it be creationism flood geology or whatever well there are two things at work here one is to recognize the usually these people have a have an agenda as you say is to recognize that their source book the bible is a composite work um, for instance, we have the story of the flood in Genesis. Now, what I try to get my students to do is to do some highlighting, like I've done here. All you have to do is take the Genesis flood story, and wherever it says the word Lord appears in that se se the, those sentences, color them one color. And where the word God appears, color them a different. And you have two different stories. The earlier story is the one with where the word Lord appears. This is the divine name Yahweh. And if you do this, you'll be able to see how the Bible is overwritten. That will guide you against taking this and running off and trying to prove something out of this pattern. These are stories that grew and developed and were reinterpreted and reinterpreted. This is the solid evidence of people. This is the way they lived. This is what she poured the oil out of. There's the light lanted, lighted. These are the things she used in her household. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming here and showing us all these artifacts here. Um, I love this mummy's hand here. <laughs> My like mummy's to, hand. <laughs> I'd like to invite you back one day thank sometimes you. in the future to talk about this. I'd like to thank you for watching. Trust you enjoyed this program, and we'll see you next time on Mars Hill.